Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. And my story isn't over, my story's just begun. And fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Yeah, fail you won't define me, cause that's what my father does.
is your own hallelujah. I can't do it for you. There's a song written on your heart only you can sing. And when you sing, enemies flee. When you sing, prison walls come falling down. When you sing, heaven invades the earth. So just begin to lift up your hallelujah. Raise it like a banner.
Good morning, happy Sunday, welcome to New Garden Church. If this is your first time joining us, my name is Jeff, I'm the lead minister at New Garden Church. While we typically meet at DuPont Tyler Middle School, right now we're still online. We've got a great day, I'm so glad you're with us. Today is week eight of our series, Long Story Short. So we're gonna be in the book of Numbers. But before we get there, let's get into the chat room and say good morning and answer a question. We are in the season of Lent, which is a period leading up to the celebration of Jesus' resurrection at Easter. Now during Lent, many people choose to give something up as a way of fasting to kind of realign some part of their heart or mind for Easter. Now this hasn't always been the most common practice in our church tradition, but I want to ask at least the question today, uh, if you didn't start on Wednesday, maybe you can start something today, or you can be praying for someone else during the next 40 days or so. Are you fasting from anything during Lent? Let's get into the chat room and chat. Welcome. We're so glad that you are here with us this morning. Can y'all believe the weather this week has been so wild? We hope that you are staying safe and warm and maybe that you've gotten to play in the snow a little bit and, you know, have a cozy week. But thank you so much for joining us today. If this is your first time with us this morning, we are so glad that you joined us and we would love to connect with you. You know, we would love to connect with you in person and we wish that's what was going on but for now we would love for you to click the connection card button at the top of your screen which will take you to a place where you can get signed up for our newsletter and it will also let you pick a charity and whichever one you choose we are going to donate ten dollars to that charity so if you're a first time guest or if you haven't made the leap to connect with us, you can do that now and click on the connection card button at the top of your screen. Everybody should check in on Facebook or on Instagram at New Garden Church. In the month of February, we are partnering with Souls for Souls. And so every 10 check-ins is going to provide a pair of shoes to someone in need. And uh, what a week to really recognize the need for something as simple and accessible to most of us as a pair of shoes. So please don't forget to check in this morning and give back and you can even use the hashtag souls for souls um, when you post. Um, thank you so much for being here this morning. Um, it's good to be with y'all through a screen, but we are excited about Easter. Michael mentioned last week that we are planning an in-person Easter gathering that will also double as our second and third church birthday party. So please make plans to join us on Easter Sunday and reunite together. It's going to be so good to see so many faces um, in person. So we would love for you to make plans to be with us on that day. Uh, but for now, keep on joining us online. Thank y'all for being here. We love you. We miss you. And I hope that you are staying safe this week in all of the snow and the craziness. So love y'all and welcome to New Garden.
Good morning. We're in week eight of our series, Long Story Short, which means we're in the book of Numbers. Now, if you thought Leviticus was an unappealing book because of all the strange laws and the rules about the sacrificial system, then you might find Numbers to be difficult in terms of like, what in the world is going on? Like the problem for us is that it's such a mixture of things, narrative and laws and census lists and oracles from a pagan prophet and the well-known Aaronic blessing. Like it's not easy to see how it all fits together. Now it gets its name numbers from the two census accounts, one at the beginning and one near the end. But really the story is more about their movement through the wilderness as they approach the promised land. The book begins as Israel has a working tabernacle. The tribes are organized and they're prepared to leave Mount Sinai, but unfortunately, this road trip goes south pretty quickly. Numbers 11 through 21 contain seven narratives about Israel's rebellion as they journey through the wilderness. These narratives tell you a great deal about the dark side of humanity, but also the covenant faithfulness of God, even when the Israelites don't know it. Once the people leave Mount Sinai in Numbers 10, things go terribly wrong. Like every story that follows begins with a moment of Israelite insurrection. The people complain or rebel or grumble. Check this out. And the people complained about their hardships and the rabble among them had greedy desires. And they said, who will give us meat? And Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses and all the community raised their voice and grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And Korah with Nathan and Abiram with 250 leaders of the community rose up against Moses. And the entire community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses. And the people spoke against God and Moses. Like that's a lot of angry, grumpy people. Like each story highlights a different type of rebellion that starts for different kind of reasons. It's worth breaking out like your colored pencils, your highlighters, and taking note of the repeated words that connect chapters 11 through 21. And if you pay attention, you're gonna see how these seven stories are a work of literary brilliance, or dare I say, literary ninjas. Each one is interconnected. They're designed together in symmetry with each story corresponding to its concentric pair. Can you say chiasm? <laughs> Check this out. Chapter 11, one through three, there's rebellion and fire in the camp. Then you move into B, the B part. You have manna and Moses' complaint against God. You move into C, there's a rebellion against Moses. D centers with a rebellion against the Exodus. You move back where C, you find rebellion against Aaron. You move back B, you find water and Moses' rebellion against God. And then the second A part, you find this rebellion and fiery snakes in the camp. The outer pair of stories, 11, one through three and 21, four through nine are fairly short and they describe a general complaint among the people. Both lead to fire of some kind, whether it's actual fire, it could have been lightning or the fiery feel of a snake bite. Uh, in 21, six, the word poisonous or venomous in our English translations, it renders the Hebrew word for fire. Both crises are resolved by Moses engaging in intercessory prayer. Now the next pair of stories, the B, 11, four through 35 and 21 through 13, are connected by their focus on the people's angry demand for food and water. The complaint for meat in chapter 11 is answered by God sending this super abundance of quail to the people that end up kind of poisoning them due to their gluttony. And then their demand for water in chapter 21 ends up provoking Moses to act and speak in a way that dishonors God and it ultimately disqualifies him from entering the promised land. In both stories, the people long for the food and security they once had in Egypt. The following inner pair of narratives, the seas, chapters 12 and then 16 through 17, each have a rebellion against Israel's leaders, specifically the prophet Moses and then their priest Aaron. In each case, the coup is launched from the inside as Moses' own brother and sister betray him and then later Aaron's extended family betrays him. And in both instances, this unique call of Moses and Aaron are reaffirmed in a very public and memorable way. And then at the center of this entire collection, you have the D column. This is a two story chapters, 13 and 14, about the people wishing they could reverse the Exodus and go back to Egypt. The 12 tribes of Israel each pick a representative to spy out the land of Canaan. And then 10 of the 12 come back and they start a rebellion among the people. They convince the people that certain death awaits if they enter Canaan. And so they decide to appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. 
And this is the story I want to focus on today. So here's the story in chapters 13 and 14. God tells Moses to choose one man from each of the 12 tribes and to send them on a mission to spy out the land of Canaan. They're meant to see what the land is like, the people who live there, the cities they built, and then to bring back word about what they find. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send out men for yourself and spy out the land of Canaan. See what the land is like. And they brought back word to them. So the spies head out and they start making notes of the places they come to. When they had gone up into the Negev, they came to Hebron, where Ahiman, Sheshai, and Tamai, the descendants of Anak, were. Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. And then they come back with a report about what they saw. And it's not looking too good. Ten of the spies come back scared and they say, The land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are people of great stature. So they pretty much say, trying to conquer this land is a suicide mission. We can't do it. But Caleb, one of the 12 spies, he stands up and he argues to the people like, don't listen to them. We can conquer the land. But it's too late. The people have already been influenced towards fear, and they they start mourning and crying out. Then all the people raised their voices and cried out, and the people wept that night. The people are in such an uproar, like so much so that they want to leave Moses, choose a new leader who's going to take them back to Egypt. So Caleb stands up again, this time with another one of the spies at his side, Joshua. And together they try to turn the tide, insisting that it's a good land, that God will protect them. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, Of those who had spied out the land, they tore their clothes and they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If Yahweh is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. But the people don't want to hear it. They're about to stone Caleb and Joshua when God jumps in and he says, hey, that's enough. Like, you don't want my land? Fine, you won't get my land. Nobody is going anywhere for 40 years. You're all going to die out here wandering in this wilderness. Now, this is probably one of like the most famous stories in Numbers, if not the only one we know from Numbers. It's a very interesting story and it has a lot of lessons to be learned. But today, I want to look at it in a way maybe we've never looked at it before. Uh, And that is in light of another story in the Bible. So does this story remind you of any other story we have read so far in the Torah? Let's think about it. In what other story do we find the 12 tribes, someone is sent on a mission to see something and bring back word. There's a mention of Hebron. Something gets devoured and weeping. Like what is the only other story in the Torah where we find not just one, not just two, but all of these elements? It's in the story of Joseph and his brothers. So remember back to Genesis chapter 37. There we meet the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob. And there's this tension between the brothers because one of the brothers is loved more than any of the others. Joseph is given a special coat. He has these dreams of grandeur that he tells everybody about. And then one day, the older brothers are out shepherding. And their father Jacob calls Joseph over and says... Are your brothers not pasturing the flocks of Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, I will go. And then he said to him, Go now and see about the welfare of your brothers and the welfare of the flock and bring word back to me. And then it mentions their location. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron and came to Shechem. So Joseph goes to meet up with his brothers, but we all know the story takes a crazy turn. When they see him coming, they decide to kill him. Now then, come, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits, and we will say a vicious animal devoured him. And to emphasize this point, it's a lie. Like the wild animal didn't really devour Joseph. It's just like the land of Israel isn't really going to devour its inhabitants. So they take Joseph, they throw him into a pit, But then Judah speaks up and voices a different idea. And Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he's our brother, our own flesh. And the brothers follow Judah's lead. Joseph is sold down to Egypt. And then when the brothers bring the bloodied coat to their father, Jacob believes that Joseph is dead. He refused to be comforted. 
And he said, Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. So his father wept for him. So there's your weeping. So you've got all these elements appearing in both stories. And that's not all. They appear in the exact same order. Twelve tribes. A mission with send and see and bring back word. Hebron. Devouring. Weeping. In a world of intertextual parallels, that's pretty good right there. Now, I realize we are skeptical people. I know I am. Like, that could still be just a coincidence. But what if there was more? There's more. So if you've heard this story before, we usually refer to the second one as the story of the spies, the 12 spies. Why? Because it's about spies. When they returned from spying out the land at the end of 40 days, so they brought back a bad report of the land which they had spied out to the sons of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. The Bible isn't usually classified as a spy thriller, so spies don't show up too often. But does that idea come up anywhere in the Joseph story? So if you remember, years after the sale of Joseph, when, when the brothers come down to Egypt to get food, what does Joseph say to them? And Joseph remembered the dreams which he had had about them, and he said to them, You are spies! You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. And they said to them, No, my lord, but your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Your servants are not spies. So we've got the connection of spies. And here's another parallel. What happens as a result of these stories? If you remember back to God's promise to Abraham in Genesis, God promises that Abraham's descendants will inherit this promised land. But in Genesis 15, it's going to be after they're enslaved in a foreign land for 400 years. So after the Joseph story, there's a delay of 400 years before the people can enter the promised land. And after the spies' decision not to trust Yahweh, God decrees that the people have to spend 40 years wandering outside the land. They both end with this delayed entrance to the promised land. And one final parallel. Now we said that the spies return with a bad report about the land. The word is deba. Deba means evil talk or a bad report. Now deba is a very unusual word and it only occurs in one other story in the entire Torah. Can you guess where it is? Yeah, you got it. It's also in the Joseph story. Joseph, when he was 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers, and Joseph brought back to their father a bad report about them. Joseph brought Deba, a bad report about his brothers and his father. See, he tattletailed on them. It's like he was spying on them. So hopefully we are picking up on all the connections. It's like the Bible is trying to tell us, if you want to understand this story, you have to read it in light of this story, side by side. Now, the stories, they can illuminate one another. And maybe we see the parallels, but how do the stories illuminate one another? I think the key to answering that question lies in the two main characters that contribute to Joseph ending up in Egypt. The first character is Joseph himself. When we talked about this story a few weeks ago, we pointed out that Joseph was partly responsible for this rift between he and his brothers. He brags about his dreams, he flaunts his coat by wearing it everywhere. But the first introduction we have of Joseph is his deba, his bad report. It's as if his words start this boulder rolling down the hill that gains momentum until he is pushed into this dry cistern to die. Now the other character that really contributes to Joseph ending up in Egypt is his brother Judah who speaks up and convinces everyone that they should sell Joseph into slavery. So we have Joseph and Judah. But how do they relate to the stories of the spies? Well, who are the two most prominent actors in the spies' stories? The two people that people name their children after. It's not Shamua and Shaphat, right? It's Caleb and Joshua, the two heroes. And did you notice which tribes they were from? Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, from the tribe of Judah. And Joshua, or Hosea, the son of Nun, from the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim being one of the half-tribes that come from their father, Joseph. Isn't that interesting? Judah and Joseph, arguably the two most prominent actors in Genesis 37. And now hundreds of years later, someone from the tribe of Judah and someone from the tribe of Joseph find themselves together again. Except this time, it's different. This time, they're not contributing to the problem. They're trying to right it by directly addressing their ancestors' mistakes. Because what was Judah's big mistake in Genesis? 
He was the guy who spoke up and talked to the others into selling Joseph into slavery. He was the leader of the gang. He emerged as this leader among his brothers on that day, and he used his leadership for evil. But then you look at Caleb, Judah's descendant. He's the guy who speaks up and tries to persuade the others. He's just like his ancestor. Uh, he's just like Judah. He's got the same courage, the same leadership qualities, except unlike Judah, he's not using his leadership for evil. Caleb is using that quality for good, or he's trying to at least. And it's like he's redeeming Judah's mistake. And what about Joseph? What was his big mistake? Well, it all started with his debah, this evil talking bad report that poisoned his relationship with his brothers. And now look at his descendant, Joshua. There's this group of 10 who are speaking debah and that sets off warning bells for him. He remembers his ancestor's mistake. He knows all too well where this debah can lead. So whereas Joseph was the speaker of debah, Joshua takes a stand against it. He insists, no, this is a very good land. And in doing so, he redeems Joseph's age-old heir. And the beautiful thing is, is that they do it together. Caleb puts himself out there, and Joshua steps up and stands with him as if to say, my brother, there was a time when we were on opposing sides of the story, but today I've got your back. Now, the people didn't listen to Caleb and Joshua, but does that mean that their heroic stand didn't mean anything? No, Caleb and Joshua accomplished something on that day. That's how Genesis 37 illuminates the story of the spies. It shows us that the story of the spies isn't just about 10 people who do wrong and two who try to do right. It's also a story about redeeming the mistakes of our past. Caleb and Joshua are showing us what it looks like to remember but choose a different ending. We don't forget the mistakes of the past. But we also don't wallow in old bad decisions. The way we move forward and one way to redeem those mistakes is to learn from them and choose a different path in the future. This is one reason we read the Bible. It shows us the stories of other people's decisions, their successes and their failures. And it gives us an opportunity to learn before we act. But it's not just about learning to be better humans. It's mostly about showing us the character of God. He is the God who describes himself to Moses in Exodus 34. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God compassionate and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in faithfulness and truth, who keeps faithfulness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, violation of his law, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, inflicting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth. Now, some would say God is presenting a balanced picture of himself here. He is both forgiving and just. But if you put his attributes on a scale, the scale is tilted greatly towards his loyal love, his faithfulness. Like, is he a God who burns with anger? Yes, but he is slow to anger. Is he a God who is faithful? Yes, but he is abounding in faithfulness. Is he a God who is just? Yes, the guilty will be punished. The iniquity of their decisions could reverberate through generations to the threes and the fours. Now, some people read this as a harsh reality from God. Uh, You know, that's not fair that the children have to pay for the decisions of their ancestors. But we see this as a reality in our lives. We all know other people's decisions can spill over and affect our lives. The mercy God gives is putting a limit on those consequences. They can extend to the threes and the fours. But what does God not put a limit on? His faithfulness. It extends to thousands. Put that on the scale of love and justice. Three versus thousands. God gives us the opportunity to learn from our mistakes and those of our parents, but he doesn't give up on us. He continues to be faithful to this rebellious people, and he continues to be faithful to us. Numbers gives us plenty of opportunities to learn from others. Every single story ramps up the intensity and you finish parts of the book feeling disheartened, but you also sometimes feel superior. Like, surely I would never act like this. You know, we say that to ourselves as we read through this, but the moment you start to think you would never behave like these Israelites, the stories have worked their magic. You didn't realize that in reality, these rebellion stories are holding up a mirror to us as we read them. The wilderness rebellion 
it functions as a cartoon character drawing. The kind that you get like at the at Disney World, the artist looks at your face, they take this individual features of your actual appearance and then they magnify them out of proportion. Like the point of numbers isn't total realism, rather it's trying to highlight something about the human heart and mind, how fickle and short-sighted God's people can become. And that includes me, and that includes you. Like who can honestly say they've never been ridiculously impatient with God's timing in their lives? Like remember Abraham who wandered through the wilderness on the way to the promised land? He had his low moments, but in the end, his life was characterized by faith in God's promises, despite very difficult circumstances. In contrast, the people of Israel have had more than just divine promises to rely on. They've witnessed the 10 plagues, the defeat of Pharaoh in the sea. Yet these memories quickly faded in the face of hunger and thirst and an uncertain future. In the end, though, God's verdict on Israel and Moses was that they have no faith. Like, welcome to the human condition. We forget to remember. We forget who we really are and who God has been for us. And these stories are an honest portrayal of how you and I actually relate to God in the midst of difficult circumstances. This is why it's important that all of these really dark stories of rebellion are followed up by this bizarre narrative about Balaam, this pagan sorcerer in Numbers 22 and 20 through 24. Unbeknownst to Israel, up in the hills, God is turning the anger and hostility of their enemies into blessings and hope. Even when God disciplines his people in the wilderness, he's at work behind the scenes to accomplish his ultimate purposes to bless and to save. Remember, this entire story isn't about how awesome the Israelites are. It's about how strange and wonderful the way God is and how God is going to accomplish his covenant promise to Abraham to restore divine blessing to all the nations. So whether Israel believes in God's promises or not, he's going to fulfill his word. So take your time through these stories and ask yourself, have I ever thought or acted in similar ways? Like what would it look like to respond differently the next time you're tempted to blame God for the difficult circumstances in your life? Allow these narratives to lead you towards a new and a deeper level of trust as you journey through your own wilderness. Because even in the wilderness, God is with us. Every week at New Garden, usually as the culmination of our time together, we eat a small piece of bread and drink a tiny bit of juice. Now, growing up as a kid, I always thought this was just the adult snack time, but over time, I learned there's a lot of meaning behind it. The time has many names, the Lord's Supper or Eucharist, but today we'll just call it communion. And communion is something that the church has done for thousands of years, but what exactly is communion and why should we do it? To answer that, we should look all the way back at the very first communion. Before Jesus went to the cross, he had one last meal with his disciples. While they were all there, Jesus took a cup and told his disciples to divide it among themselves. Then he broke up some bread into smaller pieces and gave a piece to each of his disciples. When Jesus had them all take and eat the bread, he said, This is my body. The bread represented his body that would be broken. When they all took the cup, Jesus told them, This is my blood. The cup represented his blood that was going to be poured out as a sacrifice for them on the cross. When they ate the bread and drank the cup, he told his disciples, do this in remembrance of me. This is why we take communion, to remember Jesus and what he did for us. The bread and the cup are physical symbols that Jesus gave us to remind ourselves of something much bigger that he did for us. So let's talk about the bread for a second. This isn't the first time that Jesus compared himself to bread. In John 6, 48, he said, I am the bread of life. What he meant by that was just like our physical bodies need food to stay alive, our spirits need food too. Otherwise, they'll starve. When we eat the bread, we should remember that just like our physical food sustains our physical lives, Jesus sustains us spiritually. Without Jesus, our spiritual bread, we would starve. Also, just like the bread that he broke and handed to his disciples, his body was about to be broken. Because Jesus' body was broken, they could be made whole. The same is true for us. When we eat the bread, we should remember that Jesus' body was broken the day he went to the cross. Because of that, we can have healing. Not just physical healing, but emotional healing and spiritual healing as well. Jesus was broken just like the bread so that we could be made whole. Now let's talk about that cup. 
Back before Jesus came to earth, when people sinned, the only way to be made right with God was to sacrifice an animal that had no imperfections. Now that may sound kind of weird, but that's how seriously God views sin. The Bible says that the cost of sin is death. So every time they sinned, they had to sacrifice another animal, and even still, they weren't changed on the inside. But all those sacrifices and their emphasis on blood were a picture of the real sacrifice that would be coming and would change people from the inside. The Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus was that perfect sacrifice. When we drink the cup, we should remember that it is only because of Jesus' blood that we are able to be born again into God's family. Without Jesus' sacrifice, we would be doomed to be separated from God forever because of our sin. So the bread and the cup are a physical way to remind us of the amazing thing that Jesus did for us. First and foremost, communion is a time to remember. Remember what Jesus did for you. Remember that only He can sustain you spiritually and that His body was broken so that you could be made whole. Also, remember that His blood was spilled to pay the price for your sins so that you could be part of God's family. Communion is also a time to examine ourselves. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11:28 that we should examine ourselves before we take communion. Communion is a serious deal. We need to take it with the right attitude. This is a good time to ask ourselves questions like, is there something I need to ask forgiveness for? If so, now's the time to do that. Or maybe ask yourself, am I living a life that brings honor to the broken body and the blood that Jesus spilled for me? If not, take time to commit to living a life that brings honor to Jesus before taking communion. Communion is a great time to examine ourselves. Lastly, communion is a time for community. A lot of times we take communion, we use pre-prepared, already broken up pieces of bread rather than using one singular loaf of bread that we split up. So it's easy to forget the significance of the picture that we are all part of one body, the body of Christ. Because Christ's body was broken, we can all be united in that one body, no matter who we are, young or old, big or small, rich or poor. If we've made Jesus our Lord, we are bound together as one body. It's the broken body and the blood of Jesus that binds us together as a family. So communion is a time to remember what Jesus did for us. It's a time to examine ourselves on whether we're living a life that honors Jesus or not. And it's a time for community. Remember that no matter what background you come from, when we're a part of God's family, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. The odds stacked against me Surrounded on all sides But I've heard you can part the waters So in your name Come and turn the tide Staring at this mountain No chance I'm getting through But I've heard they can melt before you So in your name I'm asking it to move Let that break
The story's not finished I know you've overcome So I know I'll It's finished, it is done Yeah, I heard you told death it was over So in your name, I'll claim this fight is won Hey, thanks again for being with us this morning. I just want to end by encouraging you to join us on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. on Zoom. We spend about an hour talking about the Bible. It's a great time to bring up any questions you have as you read through the week. But we usually read a chapter or a short story and then discuss what it teaches about God, what it teaches about us, and then what we can apply to our lives. Everybody is welcome. Some people talk, some people just listen. All are appreciated. You can find the link at newgarden.church slash chat. So I hope to see you Tuesday night, but I will definitely see you next Sunday right here online.